good morning, and it's good to see everyone today. And a beautiful morning out there today. And uh, Beth and I, we were coming across the bay a while ago, and the water was almost flat, and uh, so it was really pretty when we were coming across. But and uh, just good to have a little break from the rain here for the for a day or two. But it is good to see everyone, and I want to welcome you to worship. If you're visiting with us today, please uh, take one of those little cards that's in the hymn book right there and fill that out for us. And uh, But there are just a few announcements in the bulletin that I wanted to call to your attention. One thing is that um, we do have a church business conference coming up this Wednesday night. We were supposed to have that last week, but we uh, didn't have all our reports together, so we're going to do that this Wednesday night. So make sure you put that on your calendar and come and join us for that time. But another thing that you see on the back of your bulletin there on the other side, right under the sermon notes, is uh, we had a, a group of students from MFUG, Mission Fuge, that came over a week before last, and uh, with the help of a few of our, our ladies and different ones around here, they did a bunch of cleaning up and things for us and did just a, a marvelous job. But um, one of the things that they did was they cleaned a whole bunch of stuff out of that white building out back and so what it is uh, just about emptied out now and everything but there are quite a few items that are still sitting on the porch out here of the two buildings to uh, to my right here left out here on the fellowship hall and then the education building out here and if you're interested in any of those items there's some like little small children's size tables and uh, a few other things there's a desk and some other things uh, an old coffee table if, if somebody wanted to take that and clean it up it would be great for somebody to use but if you're interested in that or you know anybody that could use any of those items, please uh, let us know if, if we need to um, make a delivery or something, we can do that. But more importantly, if you see something out there that you want or need, please take it. And uh, we're trying to get those things uh, cleaned up around here. So those are the announcements that I have for you this morning. And I want to just say uh, I'm going to take a, a point of a privilege here. Many of you already met him this morning, or you might have met him previously, but it's a, a pleasure to have uh, Brother Rick Ellison with us this morning. He's our Director of Admissions for the Baldwin Baptist Association. And uh, if you didn't already get one of those little brochures that he had, that he had some uh, little cards that have some things about the ministries of the Baldwin Baptist Association. There's some more of those on the table in the foyer in case you didn't get one. So let me just encourage you to get that. And if you have any questions about the work of the association, please talk with Rick uh, before you get away from, from the um, worship's time today. We're going to begin our time of worship by reading. I'm going to read uh, Psalm 57 as we uh, begin this morning before we pray. And so we see here it says, Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. I am surrounded by lions. I lie down among devouring lions, people whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. God be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. They prepared a net for my steps. I was despondent. They dug a pit ahead of me, but they fell into it. My heart is confident, God. My heart is confident. I will sing. I will sing praises. Wake up, my soul. Wake up, harp and lyre. I will wake up the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. God be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. Let's pray together. Father, we do recognize as we read these words, these beautiful words, that we do have those enemies that are against us. And Lord, we recognize that we have that great enemy in Satan who is always set against us and he sends his, his demons against us. But Lord, we see that the psalmist answered the threats of those that came against him with a heart and a mouth full of praise. And so Lord, we lift you up today. Lord, when we fix our gaze on you, when we look to you, the words of the song that we sing are so true. 
that when we turn our eyes upon Jesus, when we look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so, Lord, I pray today that whatever it might be that is filling our hearts or weighing us down today, that we would just lay those things aside, that we would look into your face, that we would look up to your throne room, Lord, that we would recognize that because we are your children, you have welcomed us into your presence. And so, Lord, I pray that we would come to you with hearts of worship and praise today. Lord, I know there are those that would love to be here among us today, but sickness and other problems have prevented them from being here, and we lift them up to you today. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill our hearts, fill this place, and Lord, as we go out from here, that you would fill our mouths with the message of the gospel. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank 
keeps me singing and I hope he keeps you singing too. 746 and we'll sing first, second, and last verses. And there's within my heart a melody Jesus whispered sweet and low Fear not I am with thee Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 He's the sweetest name I know. He fills my every longing, He keeps me singing as I go. And all my life was wrecked by sin. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings. Turned the slumbering boards again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the sweetest name I know. Fills my every moment. Coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, and I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 he's the sweetest. time. I just love it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. He pages back 586 and I hope y'all remember this one. He's got the whole world in his hands. We'll sing all four verses. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the wind and the rain. He's got the
that, would you please say amen? Amen. 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 Y'all may be seated. sing those old songs like that more often and truth be told you know so many people nowadays that kids especially don't know those songs you know they they've not grown up singing them like many of us have and, and uh, such as that but this morning if you have your bible i want you to turn back with me to acts chapter 9 and over the last few weeks here we've been considering acts 9 and conversion of saul now this is just one of those very memorable stories uh, in the Bible, and as we move through these verses here, we've seen this transformation that takes place when Jesus intervenes. And so today is, uh, it says in your bulletin there, it's part three. Technically, this is part four. We talked about part three a little bit uh, Wednesday night here in the prayer meeting. But when we, what we've seen so far is that when Jesus intervenes, the haughty become humble. And uh, certainly we see that, that Saul was humbled by his experience that he had there. We also saw that when Jesus intervenes, persecutors become petitioners or prayers is another way we, we talked about that there. And we certainly see that, Paul, that Saul, Paul, later he was known as, uh, was praying during this time. We've also saw uh, last week when Jesus intervenes that the fearful become faithful. And we saw that last week with Ananias and uh, how he at first was fearful about going to speak to Saul. But God said, listen, I have chosen this man to be my instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the Jews and the kings and others. And so he, he became faithful in going and sharing further with Saul. And then we've also saw Wednesday night that when Jesus intervenes, the lost become saved. We talked about that process of what Paul went through or Saul went through there and how he experienced the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And then he committed his life to Jesus Christ. And today what I want to show you is that when Jesus intervenes, enemies of the church become evangelists for Christ. Enemies of the church become evangelists for Christ. Now, before I read the text this morning, let me just point something out. That word evangelist that we use there, is, uh, it comes right out of the Greek. It, we, we talk about the evangelon. That's the good news is what it really means. And uh, so that's the whole idea here. And uh, so that's what we're talking about. Not just that they become vocational evangelists. Don't get the wrong idea here. That's not what we're talking about. All of us, and we're going to see that, all of us are called to be evangelists. We're all called to be proclaimers of the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's read this, this text. And I'm going to begin right in the middle of verse 19. And uh, this is after uh, Saul had gotten his vision back and all that. And in the middle of uh, verse 19, it says, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He is the Son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who is causing havoc for those who called on his name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now listen, friends, let me just say right quick and uh, parenthetically here, kind of, this is the sermon within the text right here. That is one of the most amazing statements that we read in this, that he proved that Jesus is the Messiah. Now one of the points that I would make, and I'll, I'll say this again in a little bit, is that we have to remember that Saul was a Bible scholar. I mean, this guy knew the Old Testament front and back uh, up and down, you know, he had studied it, and so he knew those things, but what happened here is now that the Holy Spirit is at work in his life, he is taking those truths that he has learned his whole life, and he is seeing them through a new lens, and he began to prove to these Jews and others that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And uh, I don't have time to preach much longer on that, but let's move on to verse 23. It says, after many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. 
But Saul learned their plot. So they were watching the city gates day and night, intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. Now what that tells us is that Saul was a basket case. <laughs> Robert Wayne wanted a joke, and there, there you go. There you go. And so, but, but in any case, that's what we see here in this. But what these verses show us is that what happened to Saul was indeed a radical change. And we're going to use that, that phrase a lot here today. Now, I know some people will say, well, of course it was a radical change. Saul was a murderer. He had been going around arresting people, putting them in jail, persecuting the church. He, he even described himself as the chief of sinners. So, um, you know, yes, it was definitely a radical change for, for Saul. But friends, I think it's important for us to understand that every person's experience can be and should be just as dramatic as Saul's. Because if, if Jesus has really intervened in a person's life, it is going to produce a radical change. And we're going to look at that just a little bit here this morning. First of all, what we need to see is that salvation is a radical change. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul would later write, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. That is describing a radical change. Salvation is a move from death to life, from dark to light, from enemies of God to friends of God, and a child of the devil to a child of God. That is a radical change, and it is the experience of every person who has ever fully committed his or her life to Jesus Christ. I mean, that is the reality of it, and we need to remember that. I reminded you just a few Sundays ago that when we look in the Gospels and we see Jesus sharing with other people there, and uh, whenever he encountered a person who placed their faith in him, he did not begin the conversation with a question like, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? Or, if you were standing before God right now and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Jesus did not begin conversations with people like that. And I don't really think that anyone wants to go to hell. I mean, that, that's the reality of it. Now, I know we have some people that are twisted and sick in their minds today. And they would say, you know what? Uh, all my friends are in hell, so I think I'd rather go there. I, I have heard people say that very thing. And I'm like, no, you don't. Brother, no, you don't. And one of these days, you're going to come to a point where you're going to realize that that's definitely not what you want. But there are some people out here that would say something crazy, but most people do not want to go to hell. And listen, while spending eternity with Jesus in heaven, and then on the new earth one day, when it's uh, remade, it's the ultimate friend's benefit. If that's your only motivation for wanting to be saved, then you've missed a significant part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I shared with the group the other night, I was listening to an audio book. It's a, a book that Dr. A, or I say doctor, he, well, he wasn't, I don't think he was a doctor, but A.W. Tozer wrote this book on discipleship years ago. And uh, one of the points that he made, you know, we, we talk about, you know, if, if, um, if salvation was just about getting you to heaven, then why doesn't he just, God just take you out as soon as you're saved? And Dr. Dr. Tozer, I keep wanting to call him that. I don't think he was a doctor, was he, Rick? I don't believe he was, but, but here's the thing. He said, you know, hardly anybody's really ready for heaven the day they get saved. That's what this life is about. It's about preparing us for that. And that's why we live our Christian life the way we do, the way we should. And so when we see this, Jesus' call is not just to be saved from eternal death. He wants you to be a disciple, a follower, a servant of the Most High God. And that's how uh, Paul is identified a little bit later on. Uh, actually, it's a, a girl who is possessed by a demon is going around behind Saul and, and his companions there. And she said, these are the servants of the Most High God. 
And you know, that's what it's really about. He wants us to be his follower. He wants you to be an ambassador, taking the good news of the kingdom of God. God's rule and reign over all creation on earth and in heaven, and he wants you to take that to the ends of the earth. And the beauty of it is, and I've made this point before, the ends of the earth have come right here. You don't have to go very far to find people from other countries and other parts of the world and everything. All you got to do is go to Walmart, friends. My friend Bobby Morton, he used to issue that, that challenge to people all the time. He was our, the international ministries director, and he was the interim again doing that over in Mobile County. And uh, we were looking at some, some information about Mobile County, and I'm sure Ball is not much different, but we could identify people from 74 different nations in Mobile County. And I'm sure Baldwin County is very similar on that. But Bobby said, if you don't believe we got internationals in this country, you just go sit down in the in the lobby, go sit on one of those little benches in the lobby at Walmart where everybody comes in and out, and you watch. He said, any Walmart in Mobile, about every fifth person that walks through that door is going to be from another country somewhere. And that, that's incredible when we see that. But that's the reality. And I'm sure you'd find the same thing right here in Daphne. But... See, you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to make an impact on the ends of the earth is the point I'm making there. But, but Jesus wants you to be a great commission Christian, going with him to make disciples of all people. And he wants you to be a reflector of his glory, shining the light of Christ into a dark world. And so this relationship with Jesus is more than just a ticket to heaven or a get out of hell free card. That is not what it's about. Because, listen, salvation is just the beginning of a radical relationship. And that's what Paul had. That's what Saul had here. But listen, we are scared to death of radicals. You think about that for just a second. We are terrified of radicals. We are, uh, we, we look around and we think, well, radical Muslims are trying to take over the world. Uh, free radicals. We've got several people in our church that are in the health industry. Uh, you've either been nurses or doctors or other things like that. But, you know, free radicals are one of those things that we talk about in, in people's lives that, that, uh, that you have in your body. And they're, they're chemical compounds that they believe cause aging and maybe different kinds of cancers and all this. You know, and so we're afraid of these radical things. And then you've got those radical Christians. Oh, man, you're, you better really watch out for them because those radical Christians will come and they'll take over your church and they'll turn everyone into a bunch of few jumping Jesus freaks. And we just can't have that. Look, that might actually be a good thing. I like, I believe it was Vance Havner who said one time, he said, most Christians are so subnormal. Now, I should say it like Brother Vance. He said, most Christians are so subnormal that when they see a normal Christian, they think they're abnormal. <laughs> Let me say that again. Most Christians are so subnormal that when they see a normal Christian, they think they're abnormal. And, and listen, I think that is a wonderful summary of, of Saul. That's exactly what we see there. He realized just how radical salvation was. And therefore, he radically committed himself to Jesus Christ. And to him, it was just a normal and natural uh, desire he had to want to tell people about what Jesus had done in his life. That just became the norm for him. That's who he was. And how Jesus could make the same difference in their lives. And I think that's the, the other thing that we see about him. And we see that that change happened immediately in Saul's life. Listen, remember what I said a minute ago about those changes that take place. We go from light to darkness, from death to life. You know, that's the reality of it. Salvation is that radical change. And that happened immediately in Saul's life. He didn't wait to start telling others what Jesus had done for him. It says he immediately started sharing the good news. Listen, a, a great truth of Scripture is that God does everything in his time. Now, Al, there's another one of those good old ones. It's probably not in our hymnal, but we used to sing that song, In His Time. You know, in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. 
And, and the reality is God does everything in his time and according to his timetable. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Listen, God sent Jesus when he sent Jesus, because that was the perfect time for him to send Jesus. And let me tell you something else, though, the observation that I've made and many of us make and everything. When we begin to look at our world and the way things are today, it is very similar to what we read in Scripture. You know, Saul could not have done what he did a hundred years before or even a hundred years later. It had to be at that time, in the fullness of time. The Romans had yet developed this great system of roads all over. You could go everywhere. I mean, you, you could just go anywhere you wanted. You didn't need a, a passport or anything like that. If you were a Roman citizen, you had you had free reign. You could just go wherever you wanted to. And, and you know, it's just a few hundred years, you know, that was not possible anymore. It's just too dangerous for people to do that. A few hundred years before, it was too dangerous for people to do that. So God did all this in the fullness of time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture to many believers, it, it starts out saying there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. And, and y'all are familiar. You know, it's, it's a time to be born, time to die, time to kill, time to heal, all that. But then you come down to verse 11, and, and this is what it says. He has made everything appropriate in its time. And he has also put eternity in their hearts. Listen, our problem is that we want God to work according to our timetable. And note, I point at myself when I say that. Listen, we, we tend to be impatient and we are obsessed with time. I mean, and, and the reality is, you know, Beth and I have traveled the world, been to several different places and things, and, and one of the things that I have become aware of is that when you go in many other countries, and those of you that have been outside the country will know what I'm talking about, there are many places in the world, but they are just not as time conscious as we are here in the United States. If, if you're really concerned about being on time to everything, you need to go to Japan. You know, there may be the only country in the world that is more time conscious than, than we are. But, but we are very time conscious. And, and we're impatient about things. We say, we say things like this. Come on, I don't have all day. I mean, you think we're rush, 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 go, 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 do, 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 now, now, now. It's always about the present. But God says, what's the rush? I have eternity. But do you know what the reality is? <laughs> we do too. But there is an area of life in which even God says there is no better time than the present. And that is in this area of salvation. Listen, whether it is sharing your faith or receiving God's gift of eternal life, there is no better time than the present. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. And there is never a better time to start sharing the good news with others than immediately after you come to know Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that probably will propel a person more in their life of discipleship than just about anything they can do. And we always, you know, I know when I've led people to Christ, one of the questions I often ask them is, who can you tell about what God has done for you? And they can, they can usually give you a long list. You know, I challenge, I've challenged you all before about developing a top 10 list. I'm going to tell you, that's a, hard, that's a hard thing for people that have been a Christian for 40, 50 years. When we've, when we've known Christ for a long time, we just don't know lost people like we used to. I'm going to tell you, one time when, uh, in one of our former churches, we had a single mom that uh, gave her life to, to Christ. And it was just a remarkable story. She came to our church office at the end of her rope. She had a teenage daughter and son, and she was having some problems with them at, at home and some things that had happened at school and all this. And, and uh, she, she brought the daughter with her, and, and I shared the gospel with her daughter, and the daughter 
prayed to receive Christ. I mean, it was just a, a remarkable thing there. But in a, just a short time, just a few weeks' time, this young single mother also gave her life to Christ. I mean, you know, I mean, she was one of those that was just radically saved whenever she got saved. And, and that's when it began to get really interesting. Because even though she was now a follower of Christ, she still had two teenage kids, and she still had to keep working to support her family. And at that time, she was working as a bartender. Now, that's, that's a really interesting situation there. I mean, you know, what, what happened was this woman went from serving the king of beers to all of a sudden serving the king of kings. And I mean, that's a radical change right there. But she had to keep working. She had to support her kids. And, and here's the thing. I've never been one to frequent bars. So I really don't know what it was like at the establishment where she worked. But I suspect that they lost some business because all of a sudden, this single mom bartender became single mom Bible thumper. I mean, this lady would witness to anybody. If they would stop and listen to her for just a second, she started witnessing to the patrons in the bar, to the people that were coming and that she was serving. She's witnessing to them there. Now, you talk about a ready-made mission field. I mean, that's it right there. But she definitely knew a lot of lost people, and she began to witness to the very people she was serving. Now, look, a good biblical example, if you want to see one over there, is Matthew. Levi is the other name he's known by. You know, Jesus came by the tax booth. He's, he's collecting taxes there in, in uh, Capernaum. And so he sees Levi sitting up there at the tax booth. He says, hey, come sit, come follow me, come go with me. And what's the very first thing that he did? He throws a party and invites all these tax collector friends and all these malfeasant people from all over the community there to come and meet Jesus. And he's like, hey, I want y'all to come meet my new best friend over here. And, and I mean, I'm, look, I know Jesus is more than just our best friend. He is our Lord. But, you know, that's really what he did. He said, look, I, I want you to come meet this guy. And so he invited all these people. And, I mean, we know the religious leaders and others, they accosted Jesus, disciples over all of that. But, I mean, Levi, he's a tax collector. Nobody wants a tax auditor to be calling them up or come see them or anything like that. But they were hated people and extremely unpopular. But, look, this guy. He became one of the great disciples, and, and we even have a whole gospel book in the Bible today that he wrote. I mean, that's just incredible, the change that he made. But he immediately began to involve his friends. And then we see Saul here, same situation, you know. He all of a sudden went from being this, this persecutor to a preacher, and here he is with all these folks that he had previously been uh, Helping the Jews, you know, they're out here trying to get these Christians arrested and all this. And now all of a sudden, he's totally gone 180 degrees and he's sharing the gospel with all these people. Look, when we see this, each of these new believers began to immediately share their faith with others. And, and we see that in a lot of other places in the scripture. The woman at the well. She ran back to town and she said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And boy, that was a lot. I mean, that's the, listen, listen, friends, if you read the New Testament, what you find is that is the normative experience for new believers. Is that when they come to know Christ, they immediately begin to tell others about Christ because salvation is is a radical change. Remember, when Jesus intervenes, the enemies of the church become evangelists for Christ. Now, I'm going to make a, a little disclaimer here before I proceed. Saul, as I said earlier, did have a slight example uh, advantage over many people because he had already been to seminary. I mean, you know, we, we read, he knew the scriptures forward and backward. He'd been taught by Gamaliel, who was one of the great teachers of his day, one of the great rabbis. But before you go excusing yourself, because you say, well, I don't have Saul's education. I don't have all those things that, that Saul had. I don't know the scriptures like he did. But before you excuse yourself, let me remind you that most of you, just like me, grew up going to church. I mean, you know, we, we've grown up in church our whole life. We've been around the gospel. We've heard the gospel. We've been taught the gospel from the time we were just toddlers, many of us. 
And, and you know, all of us, or all, of, I say not all of us, but a lot of us had parents who loved the Lord. They taught us His Word. Almost all of us here have the same, have the same ability and opportunity that Saul had. And listen to this, 100% of us who are really saved have the very same Holy Spirit in our lives that Saul did. And the Spirit is no less powerful today than he was 2,000 years ago when Saul of Tarsus came to know Jesus Christ. And so we have the same we have the same spirit. We have the entire counsel of the word of God. So, and you know, the other thing is, like I made the point a few weeks ago, it's been wonderfully indexed for us. And, and you know, we have these wonderful little things out here these days, these little tabs that you can put on it. You can buy one of these Bibles. It's got the little thumb tabs on it and everything. So you can find it. But, but listen, it is not a crime to write in your Bible. Start with the Roman road and, and, and write Notes at the top of the margin up there. You need to learn that to share with people and things. But, you know, we can do that. And that all leads us to the application. Let me remind you again of that quote from Vance Hatton. Most Christians today are so subnormal that when they see a normal Christian, they think they're abnormal. And, and why is that? Well, let me ask you another question. And this is the first real question I'd ask you. Have you really been radically saved? Now, now listen to you. There's really only one answer to that question. Most of you probably already figured that out. And the answer is yes. If you are not radically saved, then either you did not really get saved or you completely did not understand the depth of your sin. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line here. If you are saved, it was radical because salvation is radical. It is being brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is being brought again from death to life. It is making an enemy of God into his son or daughter and a friend to the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, if you were saved, it was a radical salvation because before you were an enemy of God. So what is it that causes us to drift away from radical salvation, to become mired in mediocrity, and to lose our passion for the lost? Now listen, I'm going to tell you, this is not an exhaustive list, but I did alliterate it here to help you remember a couple of these things. One is fear. Now we've talked about this before, and we hear it all the time. We say it all the time. I just don't know if I can share my gospel, share the gospel with people. You know, I, I have some friends, y'all know, Y'all been around me enough to know. Now, even I get a little worn down sometimes, and I just want to be by myself. But I am not an introvert. Y'all know what I'm saying? I am not an introvert. And I have some introverted friends that, I mean, you know, if they were a turtle, and their head would not be visible because it would be pulled so far into their shell. Y'all know what I'm saying. But I am not an introvert. And I understand there are people out here that are introverted. But I tell you what else. I know that the gospel radically changes people's lives. And, and it can take that person who might have been scared to death to talk to people. And because they've been radically changed in their life, give them the ability to share with other people. But fear is one of those things that, that sometimes causes us to, to drift away and lose our passion for the loss. But another one, in addition to fear, is friction. And, and let me explain that. There is this, and, and we see this clearly, there is just this constant rubbing against the world today that really in a lot of ways makes us insensitive to other people out here in the world. It makes us insensitive to lost people because we have been rubbed and rubbed and rubbed the wrong way many times and we just, we just don't, want, we don't want to have anything to do with those people. And, and you know, and it's, it's tragic that we're that way. We, we need to recognize that those people are in the power of the evil one. And so we, we have to remember that. We have to always do that. So friction is another one. Listen, our friends and family can be another one there. You know, if, if you really commit yourself wholly to Jesus, you might lose some friends and you might lose some family members. And, and I don't mean that they're going to cease to be your family. 
but they may not want to spend time with you like they once did. You know, I, I talked last week about this issue of conviction. Uh, and well, I think this is weird scenario. I was talking about that. And one thing about it, when a person comes under conviction, there's only one of two responses. They are either gonna, they're either going to respond to that conviction positively and draw closer to God, or they're going to run from it. They're going to go the other way. There's no ambiguity. There's no in-between. There's no staying neutral. Conviction always produces one of those two things. And if you become a radical Christian and you really are following Christ the way you should, it's either going to bring people closer to Christ or it's going to drive people farther away from Christ. And, and you just need to accept that right on the front end. You just need to understand that's just the way it is. And, and the reality is, you know, this goes kind of back to the fear thing. Sometimes we're fearful of losing those relationships or we're fearful that, that we're going to drive people farther away from Christ and all that. But the reality is they're already lost. They are already on a path to hell. And sometimes they need a reality check. Sometimes they need to be confronted with those things. Now, we have to use some discretion in that. But I think at the same time, we have to recognize we're not going to push them any farther away from Christ because they are already going 180 degrees away from our Lord. But then there's one other thing that I would say here, and it's focus. The world and its temptations are constantly vying for our attention. And the devil uses those things to slow us down. He wants to get our attention. He wants to pull our attention in other areas there and get off on tangents and do things. And we fail to look at the word of God and see that the normative response to salvation is to go out and tell other people about what happened to us. I mean, that's, that's just the reality of it here. So what do we do about it? Well, two things. We have to remember and repent. Remember and repent. Jesus told John to write to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, keep in mind, Jesus is saying this through John to the church. He's saying this to a whole body of believers here. And so there's, there's two ways to apply this. On the one hand, we need to apply this as a church. We need to ask ourselves constantly, have we lost our first love as a church? And we need to look at those, look at the heights that we have been to. But there's also a personal application here because salvation is a personal issue as well. And so we need to remember how far we've fallen. And in order to do that, you must remember the height of your salvation and also the depth of your lostness. And then you've got to repent and do those works that you did at first. Now, here's the question. What were those works? Now, each of us could answer this for ourselves, perhaps. But what were your desires when you first came to know the Lord? And, and you think about that. In your life, I bet you when you first came to know the Lord, you had a desire in your life to spend time with Jesus. You, you wanted to pray back then. And while your prayers probably lacked the eloquence that they have today, they were sincere and they were from the heart. I, I tell you what, I love to hear children pray. Because they just say what's on their mind. They just say what's in their heart. And they just speak it to God however it comes out. Sometimes we need to get back to doing that. You know, you probably in your life when you first came to know Christ had a hunger for the word of God. And you just believed it by faith even though you didn't understand all of it. Now again, this is one of those places where Saul had a little bit of an advantage over us. Because he didn't know the scripture so well. But we have all of what he wrote down and, and all that. But, but you probably had a hunger for that. And you just believed it by faith. I'm sure that you had a longing to be with God's people in, in worship and Bible study and fellowship. And listen, in your excitement, you probably even shared your newfound faith with some folks. And no doubt some of them were excited with and for you. And there were others that probably just thought you'd lost your mind. But you had been radically saved. And that's who you were now. 
And why did you do that? Because you were radically saved when you first came to know Christ and you had that radical relationship. And listen, one other point I would make about all this is that even if you didn't fully understand it, when you first came to know Christ, you began walking in the Spirit. And at the end of each of the letters of the, to the seven churches that we see in Revelation 2 and 3, the Lord ended with these words that he told John to write down. He said, let anyone who has ears listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. We may not have understood how the Spirit was leading us, or even that the Spirit was leading us, but the Spirit was leading us. I, I love, we sang that, that song, he's got the whole world in his hand. It's got that verse in there about he's got the tiny little baby in his hand. You know something, he, he does have the tiny little newborn baby, but you know what else he does? I, I think there's almost there's like this special grace for new believers that, that, that Jesus does in their life there. And, and he, he just helps them along. I think he kind of just protects them in those early days a lot of the time. Now, some of them, they immediately, in some other places, they immediately begin to experience that opposition. But it's like God just produces this excitement in new believers and, and helps them to get started on all this, even though they may not fully understand it. But to bring all this full circle, Remember that what we're doing is considering Saul's conversion and how an enemy of the church became an evangelist for Christ. And while we know from his writings that he had difficulties along the way, we can also see that Saul never got over his salvation. I mean, never did he get over it. And I think he always remembered where he'd come from, and he always kept his eyes fixed on where he was going. And listen to this, he overcame that friction of the world by liberally applying the oil of the Spirit. We have got to walk in the Spirit. And we have got to worship the Lord. We have got to stay in His Word. That's the key. If we live out a radical faith, other people are going to see it. And they are going to be drawn to Jesus Christ. But you can't just work it up. It's got to come down. And so that's why we must live in the power of the Spirit. I want to end the message this morning by reading some words from a, a song. Some of you will remember Keith Green, I believe, wrote this back in the, probably in the late 60s, early 70s, somewhere in there. But the words are, my eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. But what can be done for an old heart like mine, softening up with oil and wine? The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew with the wine of your blood. And then there's another chorus that was written later. It says, but what can be done for an old heart like mine? Soften it up, cleanse me, I cry. Let my heart break, let tears once again flow down my face. For the souls of lost men. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that that would be our heart's cry. And Lord, we recognize that prayer is such an important part of evangelism. And we know that Saul, Paul, was one of those who was given to prayer. He said to the churches, I constantly remember you in my prayers when I call out to you night and day. And so, Lord, we know he was a man given to prayer, but he was also a man given to your word. He was a man controlled by your spirit. And, Lord, he made a great impact on the world. Even as he said, I have purposed in my life to go to those places where they have not yet heard the gospel. 
Lord, we recognize today that there are some places that may just be right next door or across the street from us that where they have not heard the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to be effective evangelists for Christ. And that we would remember that we were at one time enemies just like Saul. But we have been made alive in Christ, and now we have become evangelists for Christ. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would convict us of our need to pray and to go and to share and to live our lives circumspectly so that others might see Jesus in us. And I pray these things today in Jesus' name. And we're going to have a hymn of invitation this morning. I believe it's hymn number 596, I Surrender All. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I'm going to be right down here at the front in just a moment. I'd be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you need to come this morning and join our church, you come as soon as we begin to sing. Maybe you need to come to this altar and just lay someone on the altar here before the feet of Jesus today and call out their name to him in prayer. Whatever the Spirit is leading you to do, you come as soon as we begin to sing. Let's all stand as we sing this hymn together. I'll tell you what, y'all come stand on this side because i got to make room for more. Here, so <laughs> so uh, this is Robert and Jill Williams. They've been um, attending with us for a few weeks now and everything, and just really sweet folks. I have, have gotten to, to know and love them and went to have lunch with them the other day, and they come this morning wanting to move their membership and be a part of our church from a sister church. And so if you're excited about that decision, would you give a hearty amen? Amen. 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 We don't have to testify, although I know you would. <laughs> and I'm also going to ask, uh, let me get this right, Frank and Laverne Mosley to come up here with me. And I'll, I'll just, I'll move on down, let y'all come aboard and build here. And many of you have gotten to know this couple. They, there are some more of those folks that have come from uh, Fairhope Community Church. And um, we, have, we have been just blessed to have several uh, active members that have come from down there and everything and so Frank and Laverne come this morning also expressing wanting to be a, a, de a desire to be a part of Daphne Baptist Church here and um, they have already been a blessing to us as well and um, I know you got a little cough this morning but I hear you sing pretty good and Jill plays the organ I think she might start playing for us <laughs> over there oh and uh, so but anyway I hear he sings Al so he's 
Put them to work. You know, we'll, we'll do that. It's, <laughs> but if you're excited about their decision, would you also give a hearty amen? Amen. 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 And now, I'm going to use one of those expressions that we never say. You know, they always tell us. I, I should turn that camera where that thing can see me. I don't think it can over here. I'm going to say this. We always hear this. You know, people say these days, you know, we shouldn't use these churchy phrases and things and everything. But most of us in here, we've been a part of a Baptist church for our, almost our whole life and everything. So after the service today, I want you to come and extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to these people. Anybody ever heard that one before? <laughs> <laughs> but if you come by, give them a hug and, and uh, welcome them to our fellowship here at Daphne Baptist Church. But it has been a great day to be in God's house and a beautiful day outside and uh, just nice to have a little break from the rain as I said earlier but again let's all stand and we're going to be dismissed with prayer brother Rick it is so good to have you here today would you lead us in our benediction today our heavenly father how good it's uh, been just to be in your very presence just want to worship you and praise you and reflect on all that you're doing in our lives father we thank you for how clearly the word has been shared uh, by pastor Jeff Father, we just pray that he will continue to uh, give him spiritual wisdom as he uh, leads this congregation and uh, as he preaches the word. Father, we rejoice that these who have come be a part of this church. And Father, we're so thankful that uh, they're on a journey with you and that you love them to me. Father, I thank you today for Daphne Baptist Church and all that you're doing uh, in, in this place. And just pray that, again, our hearts would be committed to share the good news of the gospel as we've been challenged today to do here with the bill. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.